Welcome to Drive the DAF. Clear, structured explanation of the daily DAF in 20 minutes. You can even follow in the car. Sechaz Erevin DAF Kof Beis contains four Mishnayis discussing four separate areas of Halacha. The link between them all is that the Mishnayis differentiate between the Halachos in the Beis HaMikdash and in the rest of the world, or the rest of Eretz Yisrael. The four Sugis are... Uh, using a peg to lock a door by placing it through the door into the ground. The next Mishnah discusses the halachos of uh, replacing a hinge that fell off a piece of furniture. Then we discuss shifting around a bandage on Travis. And the last one is fixing a musical instrument that has a broken string. So first of all, we begin with a Mishnah discussing the peg the bolt that's placed through the bottom of the door into the threshold, which is under the door, and that's how you lock it. So there are three possible halachos here. It could be Aser Daraisa, Aser Darabanon, or Mutter. And there are two possible cases. The bolt uh, could be detached and just placed into the slot where it's meant to be, but when it's not there, it's lying around. Or it could be tied by a string that suspends it somewhat in the air so that it drags on the floor or it hangs but it's not actually lying fully on the floor. So, obviously, the case where it's not attached is a bigger problem, because there it looks like you're building uh, the peg into the ground. You take a random stick, and you stick it through the hole and into the ground. That doesn't look like it's something which is created to lock the door. That looks like you're attaching the door, or you're attaching the peg to the floor and to the to door. So since it looks like building, that's more problematic. If however it's hanging from a string, it's more clear that it's a locking device and that it's not just something that you are constructing. Now, what are the halachos here? So these two things take two of the three halachic positions available, and the machokas is which two they take. According to the Tanakam and the Mishnah, the lighter case where it's hanging is Asr Dura Banon, and therefore it is permitted only in the base of Migdash, but not outside the base of Migdash. And the stricter case where it's actually on the floor, that's Asr Daraisa. According to Rabbi Huda, both are one level shifted more Lakula. If it's hanging, it's Mutter everywhere. And if it's lying around, then it's Asr Midra Banon. But no case is actually Asr Midaraisa. That's a mission. The Gemara brings a Brisa, which spells this out. The Gemara says it, it's the same machlokas, but it's phrased differently. Here, it's what is the case of the Isser de Rabbanon that's mutter in the Besam Mikdash and elsewhere. According to the Chachamim, that's where it's hanging. And according to Rabbi Huda, that's where it's on the floor. Now, what's the halacha? So the Gemara quotes the Amayi Rabbi Yehuda in the name of Shmuel, who says that halacha is like Rabbi Yehuda as far as where it's hanging. That that's mutter. Rashi points out that the halacha is like the Chachamim as far as the peg which is lying around, that that's Aser Daraisa. So we end up with a split decision. We have mutter and Aser Daraisa, but we don't have anything which is actually Aser Darabonon at all. Rava says, the halacha is only like Rabbi Yehuda, that it is mutter if it's hanging, only if it is tied to the door itself. Then it looks like a door locking device. If it's tied to the doorway, it looks like building, and that doesn't count. The Gemara asks, how could you say that? But there was a story with Rabbi Tavlo and the Mechuzah, and he saw that they were locking the door with the bolt, which was hanging from a bar that's used to close the door. It wasn't on the door itself, and it didn't protest and say it's wrong. The Gemara says, there you have a different hat there, there. The rope that was holding it was strong enough that you could actually lift it up, and in a situation like that, it's okay even if it's hanging from the wall and it's not hanging from the door. Okay, now the halacha here, the Gemara says that Rav Avia went in a harda and he saw somebody that was tying the peg to the doorway with a reed, and he said that's not strong enough, that's going to break, that doesn't make it mutter. Now the Gemara asks, what if the threshold is worn away so that the peg sticks through the threshold actually into the ground? Does that change the halacha? So the Gemara says that Rav Yosef said, what kind of shayla is that? It's an explicit machlegis in a brisa. Uh, the brisa says that if it's ripped off, then it's aser. And the machlegis on a kama. And Rabbi Yehuda, if it goes through the threshold into the floor, Rabbi Yehuda says it's aser, and the kama says it's mutter. What's the halacha there? Again, the Amayah Rabbi Yehuda says in the name of Shemot Halacha, is like Rabbi Yehuda, the Tana, that it's Aser. What's the reason? It looks like building. Okay, now the Gemara has another question. This is Rabbi Nechumi Bar Zechariah asking Abayi, what if there's a handle on the bolt? So Abayi said, that's like the case of the uh, handle of the bolt with a knob on it, which we saw in the Mishnah on the previous daf. And over there we said, it looks like a 
pestle that you use to grind, and therefore it's a clee. As long as it's a clee, it doesn't look like a building device. It looks like something that's just temporarily used to lock, and therefore there's no problem of looking like baina, and that's okay. On that subject, the Gemara has two halachas about a very large object. Usually we say that a very large object, if it's too heavy to move around easily, is mukta. The Gemara is going to bring two cases of very large objects that are difficult to move, but they're not mukta because they are clearly defined as a clee. A clee, even if it's very large, is not mukta. The first is a very big beam of wood, that Rav Padas had in his house, and what they would do, it took ten men to move it, it was so heavy, but they would shove it against the door at night for security, and he let them because he said that that's a kli, and that's fine, even though it's too big to move easily, it's a kli, it's okay. Um, there was a large mortar, a bowl, that uh, was large enough to hold a half core, it's between 30 to 60 gallons, um, and this was in the house of Mashmuel, and even though it was very large, Shmuel allowed them to move it because, again, it was a clee and it had a clearly defined function. Okay, now the Gemara switches gears slightly and it goes into the locus of an ohel. Again, an ohel is a temporary structure, which is also their abundant to create, if it provides shelter of some sort. That means you're creating a roofed area that either shelters you or you're meant to use the space under it. Uh, if it's just a wall without any roof, so generally that's permitted. Um, if it's halachic, if it's halachically significant, the wall then it would be forbidden. But that's not what we'll discuss here. So the Gemara says that Rami Bar Yecheskel sent the message of Amram. Tell us some halachos about the dome of the ship. What's the dome of the ship? The sailors on the boat needed protection from the sun and the wind. So what they did was, is they created a dome over the ship. How was it made? There were ribs that arched over the deck of the ship, running parallel to each other along the ship, meaning the arches started on one side and ended on the other side, and there were a series of these arches lined up near each other, almost like the uh, ribs of a house, but they were arched, and they were uh, over the ship, and they would spread a heavy cloth over the ship, and that would provide protection um, from the sun and from the wind and from the rain. So now... So he sent him, and he said that the way to create this on Shabbos, the way to spread it on Shabbos, is as follows. First of all, if the ribs are at least a tefach wide, then you already have an existing OL. The rib itself is a tefach wide that counts as an OL, then you're allowed to spread the cloth um, over it. Or, even if the ribs are not, if as long as you leave the cloth there already, at least spread a tefach, that's okay. Or if the ribs are less than three tefachim apart, then you have love it, and it counts as if it's a tefach wide. The point in all these is that you have an existing oil, and you're allowed to unfold and unroll the rest of the cloth. You're adding on to an oil, adding on to an oil which already exists is not usser. Similar case, the Gemara said that um, there were male sheep in the home of Rav Huna that were uh, troubled by the sun during the day, but at night they needed air. So he had to have a shelter for them during the day, and he had to remove it at night. The question was what to do on Shabbos. So he came to Rav. And Rav said, put the cloth on a frame and leave it unrolled at least a tefach uh, when you take it off Friday, Friday evening. And that way you'll be able to put it back even on Shabbos because you already have a tefach there. Okay, the Gemara now discusses a curtain. A curtain that's just made for privacy. It doesn't have any halachic significance. The Gemara says you're allowed to put it up and take it off on Shabbos. It's not an oil. It's not a roof. It's just a wall. Now the Gemara discusses a canopy that goes over the bed. Now, uh, the way they uh, used to have it was the canopy was set up like a roof. There was a rib in the middle that ran lengthwise to the bed, and the cloth sloped downward from that central apex down to the sides of the bed. So you let it put that on on Shabbos. So the Gemara says you are. And now the Gemara says there's a few circumstances in which you're not. First of all, if there is a flat part at the top of the apex of this cloth, which is a tefach wide, that's counted as a roof. Now, uh, that's creating an oil if you were to stretch it there, you're not allowed to do that on Shabbos. Or, even if there's no flat part, that's a tefach. But within the top three tefachim of this uh, roof thing, there is a width of a tefach, meaning if at some point, any point within the top three tefachim, with the widest spot would be the bottom uh, of, the, of the top three tefachim, if at that point or higher you have space between the 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 sloped walls of sheet. If you have space there of a tefach, that counts as a 
tefach roof. The reason is, of course, because since it's within three tefachim of the top, it's all lovud. It's considered flat, and that's a tefach roof, and that would be problematic. The Gemara says, and also if the bottom was more than two tefachim wide, so that you have a space of a tefach each from the ends, from the sides to the center, that would also be problematic. Now Rashi asks, who in the world has a bed less than two tefachim wide? Rashi explains that you have a number of these roofs lined up next to each other, uh, and therefore you can get two tefachim in each of them, and you could use it for a bed which is many tefachim wide. Okay, now the Gemara discusses a hat, a felt hat. So the Gemara says a felt hat could be problematic. Rev Shisha, but Rev Edi says it's permitted. The Gemara says there's a price that says that it's us or to wear the hat. The Gemara says not a problem. One is referring to where there's a brim of tefach wide. That's an OL. One is referring to where there's no brim of tefach wide. You don't have a problem. The Gemara says, what do you mean? If I were to stretch my talus over my face and it sticks out a tefach, that would be a problem. Like the brim, that can't be. The Gemara says, you're right. The problem over here has nothing to do with the OL. The problem over here is that it may blow off and you'll carry it. So if you put it on firmly, then it's okay. That's what Rav Shisha, Brady Rav Edi was referring to. If it's loose, then there's a problem that's going to blow off, and that's what the price was referring to. That's why it's us or there. Okay, this concludes the sugya. Now we start the next mission, which discusses a hinge in a piece of furniture. And again, this is brought here because this is a difference in halacha between in the base of Megdash and out of the base of Megdash. Something like that usually means that it is um, an Isur Darabanon, and there are no Isur Darabanon in the base of Megdash itself. Now again, here we have three options. Mutter, Asur Darabanon, and Aser de Eraisa. And again, it's a Machlokas Tanakama and Rav Yehuda. And again, there are two cases, and the question is where the two cases line up. The two cases are where you have a hinge that holds the door of a piece of furniture. Now, the way the hinge worked, again, it was a peg, which was stuck in the hole in the bottom of the door and then into the furniture and in the top of the door and into the furniture. And the door pivoted on the peg itself. Now, the one on the bottom is less problematic. It's less likely to be firmly wedged, which would be building on Shabbos. The one that's in the top of the door, that has to be wedged in firmly, and if it's wedged in strongly, that would be an issue of binyan bekelim, building in a kli on Shabbos. Now, therefore, those are the two cases. Uh, the question is where they line up, and again, Rabbi Huda goes leniently. He says that the bottom peg is mutter, the top peg is also de Rabbonon, and therefore it's mutter in the base of Megdash. And the Chachamim, the Tanakama, say no, the bottom peg is also in the base of Megdash, that's Isser de Rabbonon, the top peg is Isser de Reis, and it's forbidden to put back even in the base of Megdash. doesn't matter because it's Isser de Reis. The Gemara quotes a Brisa, which reflects the opinion of the Chachamim. It says that uh, the lower hinge you are allowed to put back only in the base of Migdash, because it's Yisr Darbanon. The top hinge you're not allowed to put back not in the base of Migdash, not anywhere, because it's Yisr Daraisa. What is the problem here? The Gemara says that the bottom one is Xera Shema Yitaka. We're afraid you're going to bang it in firmly, and that will be Yisr. Uh, now, the upper hinge you do have to install firmly, and that would be actual building. That's why it's in Yisr Daraisa. Now, as far as if you have a door of a structure that's built into the ground, like a well or a cave or a cistern, one of these things, there it's in Isser Daraisa, even in the lower hinge, and you shouldn't do that at all. Okay, now we get to the next mission, which discusses the luck of replacing a bandage on Shabbos. Again, there'll be a difference between the Beis HaMikdash and everywhere else. Now, there's a Machlok is Rashi and tells us what the Isser here is at all. Rashi learns this is not about medical treatment. The issue here is smoothing. If you put a bandage on, even if you're allowed to medically, uh, meaning halachically, there's no problem of schikas samelanim, the gzair against medical treatment on Shabbos, uh, then you could still have a problem if you would smooth the bandage in a way that um, flattens it out. That would be an iser daraisa of mimachik. Um, the thing here is that we may allow you to do this in the base of Migdash if it's, uh, if it's uh, only an iser derabonon in some circumstances because you need to uh, do that, a Kohen has to take the bandage off in order to do the avoda because he can't have something interfering between his skin and the kalim that he's working on. So then he would have to put the bandage back on afterwards. Now, the reason there's no iser of schika salman, of medical treatment, according to Rashi, is because you're putting something back. And that is never a problem. It's only a problem to do something in the first place. So, the sig over here does not have a machlokas. This mission just says simply you're allowed to put the bandage back on in the base of Migdash, but not elsewhere because it's an Isser der Abanon.
uh, but to put it on in the first place, that's an iser deraisa of mamachik, and therefore uh, it's forbidden everywhere. Now the iser de rabbanon here is a gzeir, we're afraid you may smooth the bandage out. To put the bandage on in the first place will for sure involve smoothing, and that's why it's iser deraisa. Okay, now the Gemara brings a b'risa which discusses the halachas of putting a bandage back generally, and it's a machlokas between Rabbi Huda and the Chachamim. Here, Rabbi Huda is the machmer. The Chacham say if a bandage fell off on Shabbos, you are allowed to put it back. It's just returning the bandage. You don't have to worry about smoothing. Rabbi Huda says, no, you cannot. You have to make sure it doesn't fall off. And he says, if it shifted place a little bit up the arm or whatever piece of the body's on, or, ch- or if it shifted downward, you're allowed to shift it back, but if it fell off completely, you're not, and if you need to clean the wound, do it half at a time, take off half the bandage, leave the other half on, clean the wound, and then switch. Um, now, the Gemara says that this, uh, the halacha is like Rabbi Huda. Uh, it the reason is because it's an Isra Deiraisa, if the bandage comes off to put it back on, because you'll smooth it out, if you do smooth it out, it will be an Isra Deiraisa. The Gemara says, as far as the fact that you're not allowed to put it back, that's only if it falls on the floor. Um, Actually, this is in the Chachamim. The Chachamim only argue and say it's permitted if it falls onto an object, a clear of some sort. If it falls onto the floor, even the Chachamim agree that it's forbidden to put it back. Uh, the Gemara then brings a incident which shows that not everybody agrees to that statement. The Gemara says, Marbar Rav Ashi was in Rav Ashi's house, his father, and he saw that he had a bandage that fell off onto the pillow of his bed and he put it back. And he said, don't you agree uh, that this is the case of the Machlokas of Yehuda and the Chacham and we pass like Rabbi Yehuda? That is the case where it fell off onto a cleave. That's where there's a machlokis. If it falls onto the floor, so everybody agrees it's usher. The whole machlokis is where it fell onto the bed. But even then, we pass like a beard and it should be usher. So he said, no, I don't hold that way. I hold that the machlokis is in the case where it fell on the floor. But if it falls onto a cleave, even though Behuda would say that it's mutter, not a problem at all. Okay. Now the Gemara goes to uh, the next Mishnah, which is a halacha of fixing a harp in which a string broke. And the Mishnah says, Allah is that you're allowed to fix the harp string in the Beis HaMikdash, but not anywhere else. And installing the string in the first place, that is usher even in the Beis HaMikdash. Now, what's this about? This is an Esad Araisa of Mentak and Klishir. Uh, it's not an Esad Rabbanon. However, this Esad Araisa may potentially be mutter. Why would that be? Well, in order to create a Kli, to fix a Kli that you couldn't have otherwise had, is permitted if it's for a mitzvah in the Beis HaMikdash. And the Gemara wants to say that this is the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer, who says that you're allowed to fix a kli, which is a mitzvah, in the Beis HaMikdash, uh, because you need it. You need it to use for the mitzvahs of the Beis HaMikdash. Now, the Gemara quotes a b'risa, which contradicts this. The b'risa says you're only allowed to fix it by tying a bow, which is not a malacha, because all you're doing is tying a bow, which is a slip knot. There's no iser of tying there. Um, that Bryce then seems to say that you're not allowed to fix the string. So it contradicts our Bryce, which says you are, our mission, which says you are. The one says, no, it's a machlekes. Rabbi Leezer is the one who says you're allowed to fix devices you need for the avoda in the basic Mikdash on Shabbos. The Rabbonon say that you're not, and that's why you're only allowed to tie a bow. The says, hold on a second. If it's Rabbi Leezer, he's, he, he would say, are you even allowed to install the string in the first place? Um, he doesn't say that, it, that it's only permitted if it broke on Shabbos and he couldn't fix it. You couldn't fix it before Shabbos. He says you're allowed to do it. Even if you could have uh, installed the string before Shabbos, you're allowed to do it on Shabbos. So how do you understand this? Why should he say that you're only allowed to uh, uh, fix it, but you're not allowed to install it in the first place? So the Gemara says, okay, I'll have to tell you that this is a different machlokis. This is not a machlokis between the Rabbanon and Rabbi Eliezer about fixing tools of the Beis HaMikdash, it's actually Machlokas Rabbanan and Rabbi Huda as to whether there's a difference between a bow and a regular knot. According to Rabbi Huda, there is no difference between a bow and a regular knot, and therefore we say in our Mishnah that you're allowed to fix it. It makes no difference if you make a bow. According to Chacham, however, you're supposed to make a bow, because uh, that's lenient, and that's mutter, uh, only an iser, um, so that's why you're allowed to do that. Nigmar says, that doesn't answer the question, because how exactly is Rabbi Huda allowing you to do an Isra Daraisa of tying a knot? Right? You said that Rabbi Huda says there's no difference. Both a bow and a regular knot are usser. Yeah, and he's the author of the Mishnah. But the, the Mishnah says you're allowed to put the string back. So how is he allowing you to put the string back? Obviously, he's holding like 
Rabbi Eliezer, that you're allowed to fix something which breaks. If that's true, then I don't understand the mission again. Same problem as before. Why are you only allowed to fix it if it breaks? You should be allowed to install it even in the first place. So the Gemara gives three other explanations of this machokis, which we shall see on the Afkovi Gemara. Drive the Daf is a project of the Grand Woodland School and is presented by Rabbi Yitzchak Landa. Find us on YouTube or subscribe to daily emails by emailing drivethedaf at gmail.com.